computer. Okay. God, for example, 1803, 1879. Uh, this is uh, the man, part of, of the man. This is the man, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, he does look like a, like a revolutionary almost. And I actually, he was. That's why he had to choose the exile because he had troubles with um, with uh, with uh, with Germany and uh, you know he, he seems to be indeed a man of great passion and intensity and he was here is another picture of him and uh, and you know I, I I like this kind of architect you know a, a militant architect an, ar an architect with a big heart an architect who fights for his ideals for what he believes in and he had, as I said, a very rich building activity, but also a very rich uh, theoretical activity. Uh, there is even a sculpture of him here, a statue. And um, so he began his professional career as a mathematician, introduced to architecture by Franz Christian Gau and Jacques uh, Ignaz Wittorf. Uh, Gau, I, I've heard, but uh, the other one, no. He began to work in Dresden, in Germany, took part in, in the Dresden uprising in 1849. That's exactly what I mentioned, that the man was, uh, you know, had a militant blood in him, published the four elements of architecture in 1851. Uh, uh, he was a leading architectural theorist of 19th century on polychromy and polychromy uh, in antiquity. This is also very interesting because our conception about antiquity is that the temples were white. Well, it's not true. They were highly polychromatic. And he had a very big role in discovering this and, uh, and sustaining this idea and proving it. Later worked in Zurich, in Switzerland and Vienna. What a man. Polychromy, term to describe the use of multiple colors in one entry. Yes, indeed. Okay, so hello, Mr. Zemper. And here he has, you know, if you look at just, well, let's make abstraction of that button, which seems to fall. And I love this because it means the man was a dreamer. You know, he didn't care so much about appearances. And it even seems that the coat was kind of worn out, doesn't it? And it almost look, looks like, of course, this was the 19th century, but, uh, this almost looks like the coat of uh, some, um, you know, peasant from somewhere. But no, this is the great God, for example. And, um, and why not? I like this, you know, a man who uh, has other interests besides, uh, you know, uh, taking care of that falling uh, button. Now, I don't know if he was married or not. I see a ring there, on, but not on the usual uh, finger. Anyway. He was a revolutionary, let's put it this way. Maybe he just uh, got out of a fight when he um, had this picture taken of him, but, but the project is in his right hand. As you can see, it rolled nicely. The four elements of architecture. Now, this is crucial to the understanding about Gottfried Zemper. He published, a book. I mean, this is a famous book, was published in many editions, in many languages, the four elements of architecture. This is another thing that he uses. He, he talks about four elements, not three, not five, not seven, but four. A number four is a feminine number and is extremely important on earth, but also cosmically, because there are so many four elements, you know, the four cardinal points, the four elements, fire, water, earth, and sky. Um, then you, we have north, south, east, and west. I mentioned the four cardinal points, the four seasons, and so on. So four is extremely important. And uh, Vivaldi would agree with us because he wrote beautiful music about the four uh, seasons. OK, so we read. I hate to read usually in my presentations, but it's just this page, and it's probably important. The Four Elements of Architecture is a book by the German architect Gottfried Zemper, published in 1851. It is an attempt to explain the origins of architecture through the lens of anthropology. The book divides architecture into four distinct elements, the hearth, the roof, the enclosure, and the mound. 
the origins of each element can be found in the traditional crafts of ancient so-called barbari by barbarians because he was very preoccupied about how did the first house ca ever come into being so the four elements are the hearth which has to do with fire metallurgy ceramics then the roof carpentry enclosure the which was the textile part of architecture the weaving and then the mound the earth earthwork so Zemper stating that the hearth was the first element created. The first sign of settlement and rest after the hunt, the battle and wandering in the desert is today, as when the first man lost paradise, the setting up of the fireplace and the lighting of the reviving, warming and food preparing flame. Around the hearth, the first groups formed. Around the hearth, the first groups assembled. Around in the first alliance is formed. Around in the first rude religious concepts were put into the customs of a cult. So what he says is that the first house ever built came into being like this. Uh, you know, the fishermen, the hunters returned from work and they didn't have a home. So they gathered around the fire. They did have fire though, probably given to them by um, uh, Prometheus who stole it from the gods, say the Greeks. And then you know, maybe it's better if I explain it because I use simpler, simpler words and I can synthesize. So Zemper thought these people understood they have to protect the fire and what to do about it. So they understood they have to protect it from the animals, from the elements. So they needed an enclosure and they only had bushes and trees around them, but they didn't have the tools to cut down the trees as the Logier thought. And indeed they didn't. So they just removed some, uh, some vegetable material from the bushes or the trees and they owed them. It was through weaving that they made some mats, some panels, so to speak, mobile and fragile. And with them, they protected the, the fire. Then they also understood they have to ele elevate a little bit the fire from the earth to protect it from floods and from animals. So they created the mound, the earthwork above. Then they, they understood they need a roof to protect from the rain. And so, you know, they began slowly to do the carpentry, but essentially there are these four elements, house where the fire was, the roof carpentry, enclosure, the textile weaving, and the mound, the earthwork. But they, he thought Zemper, that the first architectural gesture was actually weaving, weaving of those, uh, you know, vegetable uh, materials, the plants they found around themselves to, to create some kind of a, a panel, some kind of a surface. So, but the word texture, you know, it is very, very interesting because actually, you know, uh, uh, the word architect, we only know what A-R-C-H means, but we don't reflect about the textural or texture. Well, it, it comes from texture and it comes from texture, which comes from T-E-X, T-E-K-S, which in the Proto-Indo-European -Europe language means to weave. So it's in the very word architect or architecture that the weaving is present. This is actually very interesting, I think. So um, we move forward. Um, the four elements we already discussed about, the, the, these are the four elements, the hearth where the fire is and was, the roof, the enclosure, which was woven, and the mound. And this is an illustration from his book where you have the hearth here, and then uh, the enclosure, you see it is woven. It's a, it's a texture, it's a textile uh, work in a way. And then we have the, uh, the roofing. And uh, here you see the base, which is the, the so-called mount. So one element, two, the enclosure, three, and the roofing, four. Okay, here you see it again. The hearth has to do with ceramics, with fire, the roof with carpentry, wood, uh, enclosure, weaving. Enclosure is the first gesture 
and then the mount. So for example, the first architectural gesture was weaving, weaving an enclosure of vegetable material found in the bushes and the trees by the hunters and fishermen who returned from work and wanted to protect fire. Weaving a mat was thus the first architectural artifact. Okay, some drawings by uh, Godfrey Zemper. Uh, he drew extensively. Um, we have all kinds of illustrations and renderings and other kinds of drawings because he also published a book uh, on style and uh, other books. So he was prolific also in the field of reconstructing, you see, uh, ancient architectures, the way he envisioned them. So just like Palladio, about whom I will talk tomorrow, he had a love of the past. He was very interested in, in learning, unlike our students who don't care at all. It's unbelievable what is happening. I keep saying it every day. Anyway, let's move on. And happy birthday, Gottfried Semper. Uh, this, again, these are studies of, uh, you know, inspired by history or uh, reconstructions that he did uh, inspired by ancient history. Uh, he also is extremely important for the fact that he underlined the importance of the ornament, something the more orthodox uh, later moderns forgot, but the ornament is very, very present in the, in the conception about architecture of Godfrey Zemper, as you can see, and it's a polychromatic uh, ornamentation. It's not whiteness, no. And the Greek temples were not white. He was right. They were, they were vividly colored. And we forgot this because we forgot in a way to live. You know, we are so carried away by the, the white ideology of modernity that somehow uh, we forget the joy. I mean, you know, here you have an intricate, you know, oven drawing that is, on one hand, oven, and on the other hand, is colored. It's colored because color is part of life. Uh, and it's very, very, very hard, if not impossible, to find plain whiteness in the world or in nature. No, there isn't. Well, the snow is the closest, but that's about it. What is very interesting here is that he also had this intuition. I didn't read his book there still. I should, but I didn't. But I know he had an interest in knots, seam, and twining. And this is because for him, weaving was so important. So, you know, this is another thing. In the act of weaving, you create uh, relationships, you connect, just like in love, where you connect to people. Here you connect to threads, you connect, you know, I mean, it's about bringing together. And this also we kind of forgot to bring together uh, in an organic way. And uh, so it's also some kind of a return of the labyrinth, I like to speculate, you know, because it's a, it's a different kind of reality, a woven reality, very dense, uh, labyrinthical, and uh, with multiple centers in a way. But essentially, it is also about continuity. Because, you know, for example, a broken sweater that is hand woven, you could probably repair. Not too many people repair these days, uh, you know, broken sweaters or socks, but in the past was done. And um, almost any lady knew how to, to repair a pair of socks or a, a sweater. Not any longer, but it's about the intervention of the human hand coupled with a sensitivity, a sensibility towards the act of doing things, of, of repairing, mending, you know, is, is probably very, very important to remember that uh, in The Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, Huxley, he, uh, there is a chorus there that repeats continuously, uh, ending is better than mending, ending is better than mending, Ending is better than mending. This is the ideology of uh, contemporaneity. This is this is what uh, you know capitalism and uh, the, the obsession of producing new things continuously is about. We don't repair any longer things. We create new ones, and that's why the chorus in uh, in the famous uh, 
writing by Huxley says continuously, ending is better than mending. But what does ending mean? Ending means throwing to the garbage. Then the garbage collectors come in and they go with what we threw away to the garbage pyramid or uh, uh, you know, to whatever destitute place that we send uh, things we refuse to repair to. And this is the world. And then we complain that, uh, you know, that the climate is changing, that the uh, seas, uh, the level of the seas are rising and so on. And then, then there is pollution. Well, all things connect except ourselves through our own gestures because we forgot to weave what we see here. Uh, he, he, I mean, look at, look at this. This is a page from his book. And this, if you look at the variety of knots, he is thinking of, and what is a knot? Is is bringing together, uh, you know, tightening the, the the knot. Meaning means bringing together two entities very tightly, uh, hopefully forever, like in a good marriage. Anyway, I will show you a few things I did just four pages. At the time when I became preoccupied with Godfrey Zemper, I was exercising my curiosity about working with Archicad. And I did a few things which to you might appear not to be architecture, but they are at least uh, prospectively or, uh, you know, uh, if I would uh, continue them. Uh, I call them pre-architectures, but they are woven and they, they are about, uh, uh, yeah, even the knot that uh, Godfrey Zemper talks about. Uh, this was, uh, you know, I display them in a, in a small uh, place uh, near Chicago where I, uh, um, you know, displayed uh, sometimes uh, architectural works. These things were done with Archicad. And yes, they are pre-architectures. Uh, Jimmy Gang, actually a very important architect from Chicago, when she saw these images, she said, fabulous paintings then, but they are not paintings. I mean, they are not supposed to be paintings. They are supposed to be pre-architectures, possible architectures that need some, some development. And uh, you see others here in the front here, you see some kind of a knot building, uh, if I can call it so. What you see is actually uh, done with architect, meaning with architectural uh, entities, floors, slabs, walls, and the darker parts are actually sections through the architectural um, elements, whatever they might be, roofs, uh, walls, uh, slabs, and so on. Okay, we move forward to the much calmer and uh, harmonious um, drawings uh, and images of uh, Godfrey Zemper. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's admirable that a man in the 19th century took the time, you know, to, to, to think about these ancient uh, monuments and uh, the ancient orders and to envision them as he thought they were actually uh, uh, when they were made. I mean, look, you know, yes, no Greek temple looks like this any longer, but you can already feel, you can already see that this, is, this was an architect who understood the, the ornamental role of architecture, that architecture cannot be obsessed just about structure, that there is more to architecture and that more derives from the from the from text from T E K S, meaning from weaving and from from uh, bringing beauty through that weaving, just as uh, as Adolf Loos actually had the, the intuition of when he mentioned the Slovenian or the Slovak peasant who was crocheting a, a sweater and loses herself in in contemplation while she does so and. And while she, she contemplates or meditates while, while making a sweater, she also creates a beautiful ornament here and there. Why the need for the ornament? Because the ornament, just like in nature, is, uh, announces in a way the spring of aesthetics. Because in the spring, the, the trees bloom with uh, leaves first and then with flowers. Well, architecture should have these as well metaphorically or otherwise, but we got rid of this. We don't think of the spring of architecture any longer so much. Anyway, um, so we have ornamentation, we have weaving, 
and we have color. Color, yes, because the sky is blue and the grass is green. And uh, <laughs> should I say more? Uh, God created the color world. And uh, color means light. And I think the intuition of John Haydock when he talked about Richard Meyer, uh, uh, and he talked about Richard Meyer in connection with a movie that he liked so much, The Shining with Jack Nicholson, that he saw that there could be terror in whiteness, excessive whiteness, and I would agree. And that, that's why he mentioned the, 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 the film, uh, The Shining with Jack Nicholson. Anyway, back to Zemper. Built works in Dresden. So we begin with Germany uh, and uh, some of these buildings uh, that he erected uh, can still be seen, but not this one. This one was destroyed by fire in 1869. This is the destiny of, uh, of, of architecture. You know, uh, sooner or later, some calamity happens. If the fire doesn't break up, break uh, the buildings, then some wars will break them. And if not the wars, the elements in time. So nothing is truly eternal, except I would say the desire of man to live, not just to survive, but to live, to earn one's life through creation, through creativity, and through bringing beauty into the world, if possible. Anyway, uh, so a major commission, a major building, it was brought down by fire, but it was rebuilt. Uh, and uh, this is also very moving about the human destiny. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we provoke fire. Yes, we provoke wars. But we also rebuild. We also construct and reconstruct. So there is a duality. Here is a rendering of the fire that uh, brought down uh, this uh, important building in Dresden. And, uh, <laughs> you know, strangely today, we have the metaphorical, I hope, desire of someone like Wolf Prix saying architecture must blaze. Well, here we see architecture blazing, literally blazing. But I imagine uh, Wolf Prix thought about the inner blazing, that is to have energy, to have uh, vitality, uh, to even bring disorder into life because disorder uh, could be very uh, energizing. Anyway, uh, so we'll see the new building, and uh, you know, <laughs> you know that the Germans are unstoppable. You know, if they if they put their mind to something, you know, it doesn't matter. Fire brings down a whole building of this magnitude. It's okay. It will be rebuilt. Villa Rosa, 1839, destroyed in the Second World War, uh, and I don't know if I have pictures. Here you see the influence of so-called classical architecture, maybe even Palladio. Uh, and I can't wait for tomorrow to talk about Andrea. Uh, and uh, look at the building, you know. So it was photographed, it seems, uh, I know, in the second, ah, it was destroyed in the Second World War. He built it in 1839. What a sad thing, you know. You know, I don't understand wars. I really don't. We could solve problems without wars. But, you know, people who are apparently wiser than us, they need to use the bombs and rifles and swords. They can do without, you know, and this building does not exist any longer, thanks to the Second World War and so many others, not just this one. Very, very sad. But this is what men are good at, you know, they never grow up, they have to fight, they have to destroy. Now the synagogue, uh, Zemp, this was destroyed in 1938, so before the war, on November 9th, the Semper synagogue, synagogue um, you know, what can we say? The hatred between religions also is something that should be condemned. Why are we fighting each other for God's sake? I mean, after all, Christianity, and Islam and the, the Jewish uh, faith, they all derive from the same source, Abraham. I mean, you know, we should, we are actually relatives and good relatives. I mean, you know, Abraham, Ibrahim, Abraham is the same person, if I can call him a person. And the three religions spring from the same source, from the same root, 
Why are we fighting each other? It's beyond me. I don't understand. But then there are brothers who kill each other. Of course, Abel and Cain is just one example, uh, biblical, but there are others. Anyway, Dresden, Zemper, Synagogue, vanished. Oppenheim Palace, 1845-1848. Uh, it's clear that Godfrey Zemper was a cultured man. You know, this had advantages, but it also had ad disadvantages. What I'm trying to say is there is a problem when you are over, over culture, so to speak, because you are uh, inevitably at risk of being the prisoner of your uh, knowledge. And uh, it's very, very hard to, to, to move beyond what you already know, but it's possible. Anyway, this building, I think, is a fine building. It's cultured, it's sensitive. Yes, it belongs to its time. Of course, he, he couldn't build Villa Savoie, you know, in 1850s. But um, it's a good urban European uh, building. A building which sends a subtle, I would say, clan day towards the past. The Zemper Gallery, 1847-1855. This is a, you know, a large building, a museum, and uh, you know, it still exists. And uh, you know, uh, it's a great contribution to a great culture, the German one. Uh, I mean, can you imagine how many? And I, you know, maybe I shouldn't talk just about buildings, you know, because it's not just about architecture. First, we should talk about the countless deaths the Second World War provoked, but also so many buildings fell to the ground, you know. And it's just incredible to me that we never learn to live in peace. And I don't understand why. Because nobody really likes to die. No, I, no. So I don't understand it. Some kind of a blindness, some kind of a madness that is uh, inevitable in, in human affairs. At this very moment, some people think of war, at this very moment. In fact, yesterday or the day before yesterday, someone in Iraq, Iran was, was killed, you know, and now will, will, uh, the revenge will come. And so it will never end. Okay, uh, so what can we do? Dostoevsky was probably right. Beauty will save the world. But unfortunately, beauty is under siege. It's under siege from the military, from the bombs, from uh, all kinds of mentalities that uh, are uh, against life, actually. Although, paradoxically, also um, Heraclitus thought that war is the father of all things. But I'm not very sure what he meant. And uh, again, his war, I mean, the war in his time was so very different from the war in our time, because it is a difference between waging war with swords and waging wars with bombs, a very big difference. I mean, it's enough to look at pictures of Hiroshima or uh, Nagasaki to understand that we simply cannot afford any longer to wage wars, and yet we will continue. Okay, so this is uh, the new building in Dresden and it's a glorious building and is standing and it will be admired by other people until, until someone has the idea to drop a bomb on it. In the name of what? Um, okay, let's hope that will not happen. Yes, there is historicism in uh, Zemper's work, indeed. But he was because he had a, an interest in anthropology and in ethno ethnology and ethno architecture in a way, if I can say so, meaning in some kind of a ur architecture, uh, primordial architecture, you know, the fundamental one that gave birth to all other architectures, and that's why he was searching for. He was trying to give an answer to the question: How was the first building built? Uh, how how did it come into being? Uh, and uh, you know, very few historicists have this uh, uh, quest for uh, the archetypal, for the primordial, from the very beginnings. 
you know, from for the in a way the etymology of architecture, but he had it. That's why I think he was able in his work to unite the two halves that Charles Baudelaire talked about that compose art. That is one that speaks about the ephemeral, the transitory, the circumstantial, and the other half about the eternal and the immutable. And I think he was interested in both. Maybe the level of innovation in his work is not so obvious, but uh, that's because of the complexity of his task, because he wanted to be, you know, following the red thread of Ariadna, you know, in the labyrinth of culture. That is, he didn't want to break away from what preceded him. Here he is as a statue, the proud architect. How many, how many of us would have statues, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it was a different world anyway. I'm not saying it was a better world. No, it was a troubled work, world itself. It was still a human world. He had to run away from, from Dresden and found refuge in Zurich, works built in Zurich. The Polytechnical School, the great ETH, ETH in Zurich, which is uh, one of the best architecture schools in the world today as well. And this is the building he built. Uh, and uh, what can we say? You know, uh, it, it still inspires people. Look, the chairs are modern, are contemporary, but look at the room and look at the screen. Just try to imagine this PowerPoint presentation on that screen, you know, and just like to imagine that God, for example, was also sitting with us on one of these chairs and at the end would we'll discuss with him, would we'll engage him in a discussion and wouldn't it be beautiful? Anyway, uh, Let's not get too sentimental here. Uh, so this is the school, one of the greatest schools of architecture in the world. And the building was built by uh, Godfrey Zemper. And uh, yeah, obviously he had great renown. You know, he left Germany, but he found such commissions in, in Switzerland. Obviously he, he, he had a name, he, he built a name for himself. And so he did in, in Vienna and will arrive at those works very soon. I mean, these are very large buildings, you know, these are, it's not just that he received a little commission, you know, a little extension of a little building for someone, a friend, no. These are public civic buildings of the largest um, um, amplitude and magnitude. This is why it surprises me that Zemper is actually not well known besides some experts and specialists and theoreticians. But I wonder how many architects, I think if we ask 20 architects, if we find two architects who know of him, it would be a good thing, but I doubt it. Anyway, uh, so of course the, the building was um, you know well kept and is well kept uh, the maintenance is great and we are talking about Swiss maintenance and you can see uh, it shows great care for the building uh, the observatory also uh, in Zurich now here is not very clear to me because I think he I mean there are two observatories but this is the one he built. Um, yeah, um, it's an interesting program, no? Uh, an observatory to observe what? To observe the cosmos, to observe the sky, to observe the stars from the Earth. Now we can travel in space. It's true, thanks to Elon Musk and others who want to leave Earth in the blackness of the cosmos. You know, to disappear there, never be able even to come back or to contemplate coming back which is to me strange. Why should we leave the earth, which the, the earth is incomparably richer and more pleasant and more comfortable than living on Mars, for God's sake, or, or on the moon, where you can't even breathe and where you don't even have gravity. You know, nothing is possible there, really. And we still want to leave the earth. Can you believe it? I mean, yes, I believe it because uh, we are on the verge of transforming the earth in, in a giant uh, garbage disaster if we keep consuming, consuming, and consuming again. 
the city hall uh, in uh, in this town, Winter uh, Winterhur in uh, in uh, Switzerland. It's a smaller building, but uh, and you see the influence of uh, you know various architects. You know, maybe again we can go back to Andrea, the eternal Andrea, whose birthday will be tomorrow. Yes, of course, there are sculptures at the top, as it should be. You know, uh, we, we we got rid of the sculptures because they became irrelevant, but uh, they are not irrelevant. Anyway, there you see the proud flag of uh, the Swiss uh, Confederation or Federation. It's a good building, but it's a building that could make us a little bit uncomfortable because of its uh, historicities. But no, once we go beyond our uh, preconceptions relating to orthodox modernity, I think we can enjoy this building and other buildings he built. Uh, his task was difficult because it was about continuity with what preceded him, but it was also about innovation. But he was not so obsessed by innovation as we are. For us, innovation is, uh, you know, is, uh, is the only chance in a way to, 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 to survive uh, mentally and emotionally. We have to continuously, so to speak, innovate because the tradition, the, the chain, the traditional chain was broken. Vienna, the great, the most comfortable city in the world in 2019 and the most comfortable city in the world in 2018. And, <laughs> you know, the great Austrian capital that has four buildings by Godfrey Zemper, the Municipal Theater, 1873, 1888. Here it is, and it is like this today. And it's right across the street from the from the city hall of Vienna, where in the summer you can watch movies on a giant screen outdoors, and it's just beautiful. Okay, so this was done by Gottfried Zemper, the German exile, because he was in exile in Vienna, running away from from Germany. Um, I love the idea of, of an architect who is also a revolutionary, you know. Yes, we should fight for what we believe in. And if we are to enter into conflict with authority, let it be. Um, so this is in the foreground, uh, Zemper in the center of Vienna. This is the plan. Look at that enfilade of stairs, one near the other. Of course, the functionalist would say, why should we place five chairs? No, in fact, seven just on one side plus two. Here there are nine, nine stairs just in this section. I'm not mentioning the others. Yes, why not? Stairs are uh, um, symbols of our longing for the above or the below for progress, pro, you know, some kind of a progress upwardly or downwardly for investigation. They are dynamic. They promote the diagonal. It's about uh, being alive, a step. Now, that's not why he probably, but it's unusual no, to have you know, seven stairs, one near the other. And what stair? You know, it's, we could call this building the house of stairs. You know? Right here, we have actually nine stairs. Incredible, you know. But then think about the stair that uh, Michelangelo built at Biblioteca Laurentiana, you know, where the stair becomes a, a lava that, that comes towards you from the, the actual library where the books are, you know, trying to give you knowledge or to, to make you ascend towards knowledge. It is provoking you. Just like these stairs are, are provoking. From the outside, you wouldn't think that in just in this segment of the building, there are nine stairs, you know, but there are, you saw them in plan. Anyway, uh, we move forward. Uh, we move forward and we'll arrive at other great buildings by, by him very, very, very soon. Uh, in fact, we, we see one already on the right side, but look at the interior. Now, could you say that uh, this is a stair that you, you wouldn't like to use? No way. I mean, you know, even if you have nothing to do at its end, you still feel tempted to, 
woke up, right? Because because it's a great room, it's a great space. It's uh, the ornamentation is singing a song that uh, it's impossible not to like. So yes, let's ascend on the stair. Let's walk upwards. Kunsthistorische Museum, the Museum of History, in, uh, and there are two parallel buildings, one for art, one for history, face to face and identical, or almost identical. They are identical. And um, here again, we have you know, these, these stairs, but they should be. So this is the, the Museum of History, and uh, the statue that you see in the front is uh, Mar of Maria Teresa. The great, uh, you know, emperor, uh, uh, female emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So we have the architect who tried to bring femininity to architecture through his conception about the four elements and weaving. And then we have a great, uh, you know, female emperor in front of the building. So we are under the sign of of, of femininity here. I would say which is not bad. I actually think we need the matriarchy in the world. It's enough with the, uh, you know, the masculinity that keeps destroying. And look at the interior, you know. Now, I would like to say, I would like to, to hear what Adolf Loos would have to say. Now, please, Mr. Loos, would you please tell us that ornaments are totally uh, to be uh, uh, avoided and uh, you know, banished from our lives, really. But he himself didn't banish them because he used marble with an ornamentation as rich as what we see here. You know, so there, a man full of contradiction. But Los Wells himself, a great architect. Too bad he had some pro other problems, but in architecture he was great. And uh, so is Zemper. Okay, uh, there is richness, of course. Now, of course, you know, not any building can be like this. And in fact, I will end this presentation with a more so-called utilitarian building, a depot, but <laughs> in my opinion, it's actually his greatest building. At least it's the most so-called modern and innovative. But who needs so much innovation when you have so much overwhelming beauty, you know? Okay, this is not maybe a revolutionary building. It didn't revolutionize architecture, but it didn't even intend to revolutionize it. It, it, it was about, uh, you know, uh, making a public building with a civic dimension and uh, an uh, adorable uh, form of aesthetics. And uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, the courtyard is the courtyard. But look here, you know, again, he, the man was inspired, but what preceded him and what preceded him was not uh, really bad. And the sculptures are glad to be in such a building as well, of course. If I was a sculptor, I would like to be in this space, in space too. And look, look at this, you know, I mean, it's, it's nice even a graphic work, and it is woven. This is almost like a, it's an woven abstract, uh, you know, graphic work. Everything is musical and dancing here. Well, it's true, uh, you know, uh, the building makes you, makes you sing, I think. Uh, I'm afraid I, I called uh, wrongly. Anyway, they're identical, the two buildings. The first one was of, uh, of art history, and now this one is of the natural history. Uh, so they are facing each other. I hope I have a view from the top. So you'll see the site plan, two identical buildings face to face, and in between them, the statue of the great empress, uh, Maria Teresa. These are buildings with dignity, of course, and they are buildings that uh, celebrate human history that goes beyond the present when on, in which they were erected.
Well, it saddens me, of course, that I see all these skeletons of animals, but then, you know, uh, the end of life is the end of life. Uh, it's sad when we kill animals in order to put them in a museum. That, that is very sad indeed, and that has to stop. But otherwise, uh, of course, the animal that we see here in the, you know, uh, in the first in the foreground is, is, is not an animal we would still see, but, uh, and that's actually a good thing. I, I wouldn't like to see such an animal really, despite the fact that I, I, I like animals, but not that one. <laughs> anyway, great buildings and uh, nothing wrong with a, you know, a primeval skeleton, uh, you know, uh, finding room in such a stylish uh, room or space. Okay, but beauty is beauty. You see the two buildings, right? Well, they are a little bit different. This one is, uh, belongs to art and this one belongs to, I don't know, here I see now there are no skylights at the top or they are of a different kind, but you know, the plants are almost identical. So both buildings, uh, you know, celebrate this one natural history, this one art. And as I said, the great empress, in between them, governing in peace, uh, what is to be governed. Maria Teresa, you see Maria Teresa and Platz, and this is the Kunst History, the, the Museum of History that we saw first, of uh, history of art, and this is the Museum of Natural History. And the, build, the other building by Zemper that we saw is if we walk a little bit uh, to the left here, we'll arrive at it, uh, the one with those nine uh, stairs um, uh, brought together by a man who wanted to uh, say something, I think, through something like this. It's probably the only building in the world that it has such large nine public stairs, one next to the other. And now we arrive at the last work, a very interesting work, it's called the Zemper's Depot. It's a more utilitarian building. It is part of the uh, Vienna Academy of Arts. And now, and uh, it was used for various um, functions, initially a depot, but now it's part of the university. They do exhibitions, the theater performances, perhaps installations and so on. But it's a very interesting building. I mean, you wouldn't expect after you saw those historic beauties to see something like this. It's the same architect. And as you can see, he, he was very skilled in assuming a more modern architectural language. You see the plan. And it's, it's, it, it's also true, he benefited from a very interesting uh, site, you know, because it's not rectangular. But I think he did a great job. And uh, the pictures uh, show it, uh, not so much perhaps this drawing. Uh, the section is, uh, you know, uh, balanced and well, well, well drawn and well built. But uh, we'll see soon uh, pictures from the large space here. And uh, it is probably very nice to, to, you know, to study in such a school. Um, construction documents or working drawings. This is the building. You know, it's more austere, it's more devoid of uh, ornamentation, but it's fine. Its function is a little different. It was different. It's more like an utilitarian building and maybe that's why I like it, uh, um, you know, uh, I even prefer it because it somehow moved beyond uh, uh, historicism and the interior I think is glorious you know it's it's um, it's sensitive and yet clear structurally it is surprising it, it's a very fine building he used some columns and uh, here he created two you know uh, they are simplified and they are not in stone uh, you know it's, it's 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 a different kind of building 
and but but even here you can see that he was interested in joining meaning weaving weaving architectural elements you know respecting the material respecting the you know whatever the characteristics of the design um, strategy he, he used um, A good architect can build well, doesn't matter what, a fence, a chair, a theater, a parliament building, anything, a depot. So he did. And, you know, uh, we can only be grateful to him. It is a very discreet insertion of history here, you know. I mean, look at this column, you know. It is transformed already, but there is still uh, some connection with a certain conception about uh, what the column should look like, even if the language is abstracted and simplified. So I don't think these days, would build easily something like this because we we severe the relationship with the history yes it was attempted the relationship in postmodernism at the end of the 20th century but in the 21st century things got uh, again uh, a little bit out of control uh, there was a period when uh, we began to flirt with uh, minimalism uh, mid-century aesthetics now we have uh, parametrics and um, you know the obsession with fluidity, but the meaning of the word fluid or fluidity would be wider. And uh, you could even have, I know I'm saying something that maybe, maybe even potentially, or no, not, not just potentially foolish. Uh, I, I almost felt like saying fluidity could be obtained e even in a rectangular building. Uh, and I know it sounds strange, but uh, maybe I'm not totally wrong. I think Mies would have agreed with me. Anyway, this is a great uh, space to work in, to live in, to, it's not for living, it's for studying and studying what else, but art, ah, this is, um, you know, more abstracted uh, view of, uh, of the ceiling. And here it is. Uh, I think this is the last picture of this presentation. And uh, what, what can I say? The same architect who, uh, digged in the most remote past to discover how the first building came into being, was also an architect who many years later uh, built this building in Vienna, a very cultured city that is uh, maybe not his masterpiece, but I like, it, I like it very much, maybe exactly because of it, you know, that is a more modest building, uh, it is more functional, it's more, it is more concerned with structure, with the utilitarian values, but at the same time, it is sensitive, I think. I feel it is sensitive. Thank you. And now, if you want, uh, if you are not too tired, I can make quickly a presentation about architecture and weaving, because this is what uh, Zember uh, is about. And uh, I take the occasion to, to, to talk a little bit about architecture and weaving, and I think this is a theme that deserves uh, more uh, attention and more discussions and various perspectives. That's why I invite any of you, if you want to participate perhaps in the future to a more ample discussion about architecture and weaving. I wrote here something, an urban abstract. So the word architect comes from the middle French architect from Latin architectus, from Greek architecton, master builder, director of works, from archi, which means chief, and tecton, meaning builder, carpenter. Well, this I took from, uh, you know, from the web. See texture. And this is interesting. See texture, because the builder and the carpenter comes after texture. Texture is older. So texture. Early 15th century network means networks, networks or structure from Middle French texture directly from Latin textura or web texture structure from stem of texture to weave.
to weave. So the oldest is the uh, Proto-Indo-European root text, T-E-K-S, which means to weave, to fabricate, to make, make wicker or wattle framework. Very important. So in Sanskrit is taxati, he patients, constructs, then follow the carpenter, ax, hedge, and busy anyway, uh, all these words. And uh, we'll see, um, but also we see it is connected with the word to join, with the verb to join. And of course, when you when you weave, you join, and 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 to join is extremely important in architecture, in as much as it is important in life. And I love the the title that uh, Kenneth Frampton gave to a lecture on Carlo Scarpa, which was the adoration of the joint. Okay. So here you see a, a, a diagram that a student sent me and he discovered it when to me it's unbelievable actually that he discovered it, you know. I don't think he made it himself, but it, it confirms my intuitions and it confirms what Zemper said. You see at the very top is T-E-K-S, which means to weave from the Proto-Indo-European -Euro language. All the other words, including text, but all the other words relating to architecture come derived from this oldest etymological root. This is very interesting and very, very important for architecture. At the very beginning, there was weaving. And now, because I like to talk about, I, 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 I try to find support in mythology, not for the sake of mythology, but just like Zemper search for a certain truth, maybe also in part at least subjective, searching in the past for that Ur building, Ur architecture. I also discovered that the, the gods of weaving were actually all women, goddesses. Ishtar, Ishtar in Mesopotamia, the goddess of weaving. Of course, she was also the goddess of fertility, and even war and love. And of course, love and war are related, unfortunately, or fortunately. Lilith, the primordial woman, the woman before Eva, the wild woman, she was a weaver herself, you know, and here she is depicted as, a, as the snake who gives the, the apple to Eva and Adam, you know, the wild woman before Eva. Eva was domesticated. Eva was, or Eve, was the woman as she was envisioned by those who wrote uh, the Bible. You know, uh, we say it was written by God. I don't know. I am tempted to think it was written by male theologians. And, and, and Eva had the unfortunate destiny to be born as some kind of a second hand, you know, or a poor relative of, uh, of Adam, you know, born from his bone. You know, and I wonder what Adam would think if he was born from Eva's or Eve's uh, bone. I don't think he would have liked it. But Lilith was a rebel and she was older and wiser and more proud than Eve. Eva ended up at uh, the kitchen, you know, uh, cooking and washing dishes. Lilith would not have accepted this miserable destiny. Anyway, Lilith again was a weaver, then maid. You know, uh, in Egypt, the goddess of weaving, again, a goddess, weaving. Weaving was very important in ancient society. We don't think any longer in mythological terms, and we don't think any longer about weaving, but it's important to do so. That is, if we love to connect, if we love to join, and if we love even to love, because you cannot love without joining. Would we? Arachne. Now, Arachne is one of my favorites, if not the favorite, because Arachne was not a goddess, actually. She was a mortal woman in ancient Greece who was a great weaver. She had great talent, but uh, she was challenged by Athena, the goddess, uh, to uh, competition. And the competition in weaving was won by Arachne and uh, the jealous, envious uh, Athena transformed Arache into a spider. Here she is, 
you see the spider, that's arachne. Uh, that's why we even have, uh, you know, the phobias with a name because it, it relates to her, arachne. Arachne was a weaver who defeated Athena and because of it, Athena transformed her into a spider. And it's a very interesting, of course, it's an obvious relationship between weaving and the spider, which weaves continuously. But there is more to it. First of all, Eva, uh, not Eva, um, uh, Athena sprang from the brain of Zeus without a mother, just like Christ was born from his mother without a biological father. Isn't it this interesting? I don't know if I have an image here, but if you look on Google images for Athena, you will see many representations of her, graphic representations of her springing out of the head of Zeus, already armed. But this woman transformed into a spider, defeated Athena, the great goddess. Uh, I should say more, and this is a, a very complex and very interesting uh, subject. Because in my opinion, then when the, you know, the myth was born, we chose to follow Athena, the so-called goddess of reason. And we gave up on weaving, we gave up on Athena, and we also gave up of the, of the spider, on the spider, and we even became afraid of the spider. So the spider represents the road not taken. And I think that road not taken includes many things, weaving our own Jungian shadow, many things psychologically or physically. But about this, maybe we'll talk uh, some other time. It's really a complex and fascinating subject. Uh, also, I have to add Prometheus who stole the fire from the gods and gave it to the human beings had a brother. Inasmuch as we forgot Arachne, we forgot Epimetheus, the brother of Prometheus. Why is he so important and why was he forgotten? I think I have an answer. Epimetheus in Greek means the one who first acts and then he thinks, in a way the irresponsible one. And Prometheus means the opposite. This is exactly the meaning in Greek. Prometheus means the one who first thinks and then he acts like uh, the architect. But we, we, we forgot Epimetheus because we thought he was irresponsible. He was not logical. He didn't think, he just act. But what is very interesting is that when I asked Wolf Prix two years ago or uh, in a dialogue on Skype to tell us, tell the students what they should do, he said, don't think. In other words, follow Epimetheus. But there is more to Epimetheus. Epimetheus didn't love the human beings. He loved the plants, the animals, the stones, and revered the gods. While Prometheus only loved the, the humans, but he didn't care about the plants. He didn't care about the animals. He didn't care about the gods or the stones. And Epimetheus, the, the so-called unwise and irresponsible one, kept telling him, brother, Prometheus, don't infuriate the gods. They will punish you. And they did, because Prometheus stole the fire from the gods, and Zeus sent a vulture to eat up his liver. And the vulture is still busy at eating up the liver of Prometheus. Now we go to the next goddess of weaving, Frigg. Frigg in the Northern countries, in the Scandinavian culture. Again, a goddess, again, a goddess of weaving, and uh, uh, again, a woman. Durga in the Hindu culture, also a goddess of weaving. And here she is. Bravo to these women, you know, these women who cultivated weaving. Okay, now this is an image created by Lebia Suds. It's not really about weaving, but there is some kind of organization here in the series he called Earth, Earth, Earthquake Architecture. Here we have some criminals. Yes, some criminals in a Brazilian uh, prison, uh, <laughs> you know, making sweaters, hand-woven sweaters, because they were told 
Strangely, I see they have, and this is an old picture before the pandemic, but I see they have uh, masks on their faces. Strange. I don't know exactly for what reason, but they, they are busy. These are criminals in a prison doing sweaters because they were told if they do a certain amount of work like this, they will uh, have their sentence reduced. An amusing thing to have criminals crocheting. Isn't it beautiful? I think it is a great, great, great punishment. Okay, urban work in Paris. Uh, I just go quickly through various images of what I thought might be connected with weaving. This is a, um, a vision of an Austrian architect for uh, uh, the House of Music in uh, in Vienna. Here is a you know a, a sweater that needs some mending, uh, and uh, in my opinion, even a broken sweater can be beautiful. It's, it's, it's a, a, a work that is woven, even when it is broke, then I think it is nice. Woven work, texture, textura, text. Uh, you know, again, we have here warp and weft, the two sides of weaving, both equally important. Warp and weft, warp and weft. And uh, we have here knots, hatching, interlock, slit. Uh, here we have the pavilion of, of uh, Benedetta Talia Bue, the, the, the pavilion of Spain at the um, uh, World Exhibition, I think in Shanghai. A great building. This is uh, another, some kind of a weaving by a rebellious and impossible and difficult architect, Francois Roche. Here is maybe some kind of a psycho, uh, weaving, uh, cyber weaving, weaving architecture. Uh, here is the former queen of Romania also kind of uh, weaving herself or doing something connected or prior to weaving. I don't know how that is called in English. And here is Arachne. You see uh, whose destiny was to become a spider. It, it, she was painted here by Veronese. And this is another woven building. Uh, and uh, I don't know where this image is from, maybe some kind of a constellation in the sky, which is also woven. Uh, this is an artist that does this kind of thing, which is, uh, uh, I think, very impressive, although it is fragile, but it is a woven work. And, uh, you know, we have this woven building in Australia, and we have here a, a cloth that could become a house, a little, well, a tent, so it, it is related, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it negotiates between a building and, uh, and, and the clothing, because you see the tent is becoming a dress. An interesting idea, uh, it is. Uh, so I wrote here some possible conceptual threads in the field of architecture and weaving. And forgive please the exoticism of some of the, of the wording, bristled architecture, bio-knitting and psycho-knitting, the wheel versus atropos, unweaving, irregular meshes, betrayed symmetries, knots, nests and meshes, interstices, biotextiles, biotex, architectural regs, desultory architecture. Ah, by the way, yesterday, uh, and a Portuguese architect talked about uh, um, Anthony Kodark, a very important Catalan architect, and I observed that in his plans, he placed rugs, you know, uh, in uh, rags, in all his uh, uh, rugs, in all his uh, rugs, not rags, in all his rooms. And very interesting, very few architects do that. He did that. Okay, neural entanglements, quantum consciousness, histologic architecture. Obviously, I was a, um, a snobbish uh, uh, linguist, wrinkled architecture. But by the way of this, I like wrinkles. Wrinkles in architecture could be an interesting theme. Architecture, I was trying to talk about in connection with Zemper, rap architecture, architecture. It's interesting that if you replace the A in front of, uh, or the AR in front of architecture with ERR, which means to make mistakes, to err, error comes from it. You get architecture, almost an architecture, but it's actually architecture, which is some kind of an architecture that accommodates the mistakes. Constellative architecture, unraveled threads, discontinuous architectures. 
So anyway, these, these were just some linguistic, uh, maybe exasperations. We move on with other images that might relate to architecture and weaving. This is just a, an initial provocation towards this theme, nothing else. Uh, and let's hope under the auspicious sign of the five uh, goddesses plus uh, Arachne, actually six, six great women advocating the cause of weaving and of text for the pleasure and glory and uh, contentment of uh, God, for example. These are exercises possible today because of scripting and programming. Uh, and there are installations all over the world where uh, people try to transform the structure into ornament and the ornament into structure. So we have this, uh, this ambiguity, but this ambiguity is, I think, very positive, and even Patrick Schumacher talks about it. They should come together, the structure and the ornament. In as much as the men and the women should come together, the masculine and the feminine, which are also present within each, other, each, each of us. There is a feminine side in me, there is a masculine side in a woman. Uh, there are, we are full of all kinds of contradictions and ambiguities. And so the same way, structure should never come alone, should be accompanied by this, its consort ornament. This is my belief, and this is what I think Zemper uh, believed too. And, and uh, the authors of these installations as well. I mean, look what is created today. These days, these are very contemporary, uh, you know, uh, modelings. And uh, we are moving towards some kind of labyrinthical architecture that unites the structure with the ornament. Uh, in these uh, incipient and perhaps, uh, you know, a little bit uh, uh, disorderly, uh, presented uh, way, but um, it's also uh, coming back of the natural, of Lily, of the primordial woman, the wild woman, the wild nature. That's what we see. We see sophisticated architects who go back to Lilith, who go back to weaving in a wild way. Because what do we see here? We see architecture before architecture. We see, in a way, architectural bushes. That's what we see, architectural bushes. I mean, look at this. You know, can you imagine after, you know, thousands of years of creativity in architecture, we return to nature via the most sophisticated technologies. Yes, we are trying to achieve the level of architecture before architecture. Look at this beautiful wording, endless bio-anarchia. So, you know, the anarchia is connected with anarchy and is connected with Cedric Christ and it is connected with rebelliousness. So architecture is its own, its, its own tale, just like the mythological snake. This is what is happening today in the most advanced, uh, advanced uh, lines of the um, um, of, of architecture. There are very interesting researches and uh, uh, activities taking place. And you see here one image, you know, which is produced with uh, today's technology, but it's, it's about, you know, going back to the very beginning, to Ur architecture. So, my God, do I have to read you this? I already told you the story in a few words about Arachne and Athena. But because it is such an important, uh, I will read it again. So Arachne, no, no, I don't like to repeat, maybe with another occasion. Uh, you saw this image where she was punished by Athena and transformed into a spider. And we see Dante looking at uh, Arachne, Arachne, very, very, very important. And we saw this one, what's happening? Uh, we already saw this one by uh, Veronese. I'm afraid I, I, I thought this, uh, this presentation was shorter, but it might be longer. Here we see Athena and Arachne, Athena on the left, Arachne on the right. And uh, yeah, I didn't know I had in this presentation a more detailed uh, material about, uh, about, I already anticipated, 
you know, I think it's very important that Athena sprang. I'm glad that I have this, this, these images actually, because here you see Zeus on the left, Athena on the right. Here you see her springing from his head. You know, so she was, she was born from the head of the male, from his brain, from his reason to defend him, and even his infidelities, because that's why actually Athena punished Arachne, besides the fact that she did a better uh, textile work, because she, she depicted the infidelities of, the, of Zeus in her um, tapestry or wh whatever she was weaving. You see here again, this is Athena springing from the head of Zeus, already armed because she was also the goddess of war. So the male gave birth to Athena without a woman, so the woman would defend him in his uh, aggression on the, on, on the world. Uh, and so this must be questioned, I would say. Anyway, there are all kinds of representations. Here we see again, uh, you know, Zeus on the left. Uh, here we see Athena again springing from the head of, uh, of Zeus. Uh, again, here <laughs> in a cartoon. Uh, but, but this is the triumph of reason at the expense of the labyrinth and the, and, and the, and the, and the um, well, weaving and, and the spider and arachne. They were forgotten because they were dangerous. Here is Athena, you know, the goddess of righteousness. Of course, here is Zeus again giving birth without a woman to Athena. Of course, because she was born from his brain. You know, he, she was his brainchild. That's what she was. Uh, and uh, Arachne, on the other hand, you know, damned, you know, she's the accursed. Uh, she's the road not taken. But I think it's high time to take the road. Of course, we have the spider woman in because the myth is still alive somehow. We have uh, spiders, we have the spider man, we have spider woman, we have all kinds of uh, representations, even Louis Bourgeois you know, depicted the spider brilliantly and was planted in front of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, an image, an engraved image where the Athena is actually, you see the, the spider on the left upper corner. She, she transforms Arachne into that spider, as we know, other depictions of Arachne and then the spider woman and modern variations, here they are, the spider woman, well, some kind of a modern, uh, you know, uh, embodiment of, uh, of uh, Arachne and the Spider-Man, uh, you know, in a more frivolous way, the myth continues to be. Animal weavers, there are weavers also between uh, in, uh, in, the, in the animal world and beautiful ones, look at the proud architect. How could it be that this little bird build something like this. Now you tell me, because I don't know. It's just incredible. You know, we use T-squares and rectangles and six years of studies in university. This bird never went to the university, never used a T-square and the rectangle, has no idea what those things are. Plus they would have been totally useless for the magnificent construction she built or it built. How, how come it built? It didn't. This bird didn't study structures. She didn't pass exams, difficult exams, with uh, you know all kinds of uh, theories and formulas to be uh, you know <laughs> uh, memorized. And look at, it. isn't she great? Isn't the bird totally great? I mean, you know, was she less than Palladio? I don't know. I don't think Palladio could have built what what this bird did. You know, anyway. Uh, the natural world is 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 a uh, wonder. It's uh, incredible. Uh, look at this, the construction of these uh, unlicensed uh, little birds. You know, they didn't have diplomas. Nobody gave them the right to build. You know, they didn't have the right to signature for signature. And look what they built. <laughs> very functionally and also very beautifully, I would say. Uh, denying even the laws of gravity. But we are back to architecture, back to, text, back to textile works, back to uh, text, back to weaving, back to Godfrey Zemper. 
And oh my God, even Reed Sullivan is here. Okay, since I opened Pandora's box, I move forward. Sullivan, the creator of the great modern office tower, he was also an unbelievable builder and uh, creator of ornaments. I mean, look, these are uh, Sullivan, uh, Sullivan's ornaments. So the man who said form follows function, he also created unbelievable ornaments. Look at them. How do you explain it? The first, in a way, maybe one of the first functionalists in the world of architecture also created beautiful ornaments. Look at them. Louis Sullivan, uh, 19th century, mid 19th century in the United States, a truly great architect, one of the, of the great triad, Richardson, Sullivan, Wright. Look what he created, the so-called rationalist, functionalist Louis Sullivan. Why did he need these ornaments? Because the world does need the ornament in as much as the tree needs the leaves and the flowers in the spring. Some drawings uh, of, uh, done by, by Sullivan in his quest for a new ornament, and they are magnificent, and they are not copied from other ornaments, they are created from within, inspired by, by natural principles, or even cosmic, cosmic uh, principles. They are great drawings, hand, hand done, you know, there were no computers in the 19th century. Anyway, um, so, there is greatness in the world, and I'm sure it could be, and, and there is sometimes even in our world, of course. Okay, still Sullivan, Sullivan, computer drawings. These I did with my first computer that I bought from a Salvation Army store in the States with $50, a black and white little computer. Its memory was one megabyte, if you can believe it. One megabyte, a little computer. And with $50, I bought everything, including the designer bag, Apple bag, you know, created by Apple. Now those bags are much more expensive, just the bag. Software, uh, they were with diskettes and uh, Oki data dot printer, plus the computer. And I began to play and I generated these drawings. Unfortunately, I destroyed that, that uh, uh, beautiful little computer when I sent it by, by plane from New York to Chicago. I didn't wrap it up properly, so I ruined its hard, hard drive. But I still have these drawings, which have to do with, they could be, in my opinion, uh, tapestries, maybe in black and white, because they are based on 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So this could be little squares. So it, they, could, they could be tapestries. And they are ornamental, of course. And there was a great program in that computer called Mac Paint. And I did this with Mac Paint, and I don't think I could do them with easily with uh, more recent computers. No, with that computer, which at that time, you know, you could have found such computers even thrown to the garbage. Now they are collector's items. They are more, uh, much more expensive and, uh, and even difficult to find. Anyway, so some ornaments done by the, the speaker of today and uh, I, I, I invite you to, to do ornaments. It's very rewarding and even therapeutic. And this I'm not going to read. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a text I wrote about entanglement because entanglement is in a way related to weaving is some kind of a disorderly weaving. And the entanglements are also very present in human relationships as well, not just in the field of aesthetics or architecture, of course, and there are entanglements in nature, and there are entanglements created by man, as, as, as we see here, or here in the in microscopic uh, natural or biological world. And we are approaching the end. I, I imagine this, is, this was the world of, of uh, Lilith, the world before the arrival of uh, Adam and Eve. Well, in the back there, we see some, something else, but in the foreground, the weave, I should have written, but I am a little bit tired and you are probably tired too. We'll come back to this weaving, 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 weaving again is the same building in China. Uh, and of course the Chinese are experimenting and uh, old fashioned weaving, weaving again, 
Arachne would have been happy weaving, you know, weaving maybe some kind of a disaster in a way, weaving again, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much.